collaboration, long time collaboration with Giovanni, age theory, and since he made a very detailed explanation of the general construction, theoretical constructions, I'm trying to focus more on applications, two applications particularly, uh, which are the random lasers, Giovanni mentioned in the last part of his talk, and quantum billiards. Okay, uh, so here's an outline of the talk. The introduction of to age theory, I was supposed to be the first one to talk uh, before Giovanni, so I was going to give you a general introduction to age theory. That's not no longer necessary, so I'm going to skip that. The transparencies have already been removed, and then I can go directly to the applications, and uh, I'm going to talk about them. these two, turbulence in random fiber laser, and this an attempt to make a, a theoretical description, analytical description, of the integrable chaotic transition in ballistic quantum cavities, and then some conclusions. Okay. Uh, one nice thing about age theory is that uh, it looks like it's, it has a very general setting. It's almost as general as the Gaussian distribution. There are reasons for this, and I'm going to give you at least two arguments uh, towards the, the end of the talk why we believe that. So it's slash, so th there is a CLT, there is a CLT argument that I'm going to give you, so it's the center of limit theorem argument, that shows you why those distributions, those apparently ugly H functions or G functions or R functions, why do they show up in systems that apparently have completely different physics from the, turb the physics of turbulence? Why does it happen? So this is the CT argument. And the other argument is the maximum entropy argument. There is a maximum entropy approach that allows you also to understand why, why are, are we seeing uh, in, in such uh, different systems almost the same behavior, although not all of them have the, the same physics. They are not turbulent, of course. And in order to make a clear distinction between what is the systems we are going to describe and what are the systems that we consider normal, I made here a very short list of things that we consider normal. So that those are the, the if the system shows these properties, means that we are not interested in them. They are normal, okay? They are, they are more or less simple. So normal systems are usually described by central limit theorem. They have distributions that are Gaussian-like for some quantities. For instance, fluctuations. Fluctuations around the equilibrium average. Einstein theory of fluctuation tells you that these fluctuations are Gaussian. Also, if you remove the system from its equilibrium, let it relax, it usually makes the linear relaxation for a single time scale, and you can describe it by constant diffusion coefficient. That's also been done by Einstein. So the Einstein, this is the einstein willenbeck process. And also, if you look at transport relating to this relaxation, then you'll see fluctuation dissipation relations uh, connecting these transport coefficients with equilibrium correlation functions. So it's also uh, well known. And if you look at the experimental time series, the observation, experimental observation, or some relevant variable like the velocity uh, in a turbulent fluid, uh, then you see that uh, in a normal fluid, not in a turbulent fluid, in a normal fluid, then you'll you see that it has independent increments. And independent increments means that's a Wiener process, and therefore it's Gaussian distribution. So, okay, this is what we call normal. The hierarchical system, the, the ones that want to describe by age theory, are deviations from this. And deviations, we have, uh, the, the, the big question we want to answer is, can we have a general argument that tells you at least how to classify a certain class of system that has this uh, universal deviation from Gaussian, Gaussian uh, behavior? And we cannot give at this point a general answer to this, a general honest answer is impossible. But we are looking at several uh, uh, well-chosen systems where we have found very strong evidence that they have this uh, very nice uh, agreement between the theory, this, this construction that Giovanni uh, just described, and uh, the experimental data. So, uh, and here is, is the list. So turbulence in fluids is what Giovanni uh, just uh, showed you. 
time series in the stock market, so it's mathematical finance. Uh, intensity fluctuations in random lasers is what I'm going to talk to you. Yeah, I show you uh, the result, experimental results, and integral in quantum billiards. If these two are uh, still work in progress, the quantum hole transition can also be described. Details of the quantum hole transition uh, can, can also be uh, described in this, uh, by this construction. And Giovanni mentioned this vertical motion in graphene series. Basic idea behind uh, age theory, and it, that's going to be ubiquitous, so you're going to find it in all applications, is that we get this uh, compound which is basically saying that you have a conditional distribution, a local, local conditional distribution that you can more or less uh, uh, find from the data or, or, or find a simple theory. Usually this is Gaussian, can also be Levy and other distribution, but usually you have a simple physical argument for this distribution. It's normally, it shows up in the very large scale, we call it a uh, uh, global scale, uh, and also locally, using the arguments that Giovanni just described. And on top of that, it, it, it may have one or many parameters, and this Bayesian call it the nuisance parameters, parameters that uh, control uh, the background. So you have this slow fluctuating background that's given by uh, another distribution that can maybe be uh, constructed in a way that is almost as universal as the Gaussian, this one. Mind you, Giovanni just mentioned that all three aspects of this construct can be extracted from the data. So both the signal distribution, this is the direct observation, the quantity, for instance, the velocity this, uh, series, this can be also constructed from data in this, all three components of this equation can be extracted directly from the experimental data. Okay, let's start with uh, uh, the, the application of random lasers by saying that turbulence is apparently a much more uh, general phenomenon than you would initially think if you look only of uh, certain particular systems, but you can find it in, if you allow a more or less loose way of uh, saying turbulence like turbulence, we, we could, we, you could call it turbulence like phenomena, cascade phenomena. If you accept that you have turbulence in stock market, for instance, this is one application, turbulence in, in blood flow, turbulence in art, this is of course a stretch, <laughs> too, a far stretch, but you, uh, you, you could find uh, in some uh, Van Gogh's or Van Gogh's. Uh, like this one, the, the, the starry night, you see some pictures that, rem that remind you of this vortex in turbulence. And also the usual uh, settings where turbulence can be found in water or air, or air flow. So apparently turbulence can be found in many different systems and that points you towards a, a, an attempt to make a description that, that has uh, this universal or statistical concepts built into it. And uh, before going into this, let me start by uh, a way of introducing what we're going to find in random lasers by uh, talking a bit about spin glass. This is a, an audience that I know, there are several experts in spin glass, so I'm going to be very uh, sketchy about it. Uh, so in, in the magnetic system, the usual spin glass uh, is uh, a phase a low temperature phase that shows up when you are in the presence of both disorder and frustration. Frustration and disorder combined uh, rules out the other ferromagnetic phase and the antiferromagnetic phase, the, the, the most common phases in a magnetic system. And you, you can get a, a phase that looks, if you make a simple picture, photograph, like a paramagnetic phase, but there is a crucial difference is that Although it is especially disordered, it has a strong time correlation, long time correlation. So uh, it, here we have just disorder, no frustration, this is a paramagnetic phase. But if you combine disorder and frustration, you can get to spin glass. And 
How do you describe spin glass? And Perizzi has shown us in 1979, back several years ago, how to do this. And the way uh, is to extend uh, the, uh, the concepts of mean field by introducing this replica uh, approach, or replica trick, if you like. And now you think of uh, here in um, Perizzi's own words, you describe how identical sy systems prepared with identical initial conditions can get, have very different states in the long time. And, and these spins can be correlated in a very specific way that is captured by this other parameter called the overlap parameter. And what Parisi has uh, argued is that you can distinguish these two by its distribution. So in the paramagnetic phase, the uh, overlap parameter has a distribution that has a peak around Q equals zero. It's Gaussian-like. It's not really Gaussian, but it's Gaussian. So it's a unimodal distribution. And if you are in the replica symmetry breaking phase, which is uh, the usual way of uh, mean field description of spin glass, then you get this bimodal. That's the thing that you want you to keep in mind. Okay? So it's bimodal in the, in the replica uh, symmetric uh, uh, breaking phase in the spin glass, and it's unimodal in the, in the paramag paramagnetic phase. Okay, that's for magnetic systems. But then, uh, in around uh, in 2006, these four uh, authors have found a analog to, to spin glass, and uh, it, this has been later uh, put on more formal basis by deriving an effective Hamiltonian for, for the photonic system that looks exactly like the uh, Hamiltonian for the spin glass. So it has uh, uh, very, very similar uh, properties that you, you, you could derive simply by uh, exporting the techniques or using the techniques of spin glass in, in random lasers. So he, here is the, the dictionary, if you like, how to do this. In the magnetic system, the spin variables, they carry over to the modes of the random laser. Uh, fiber, fiber is not important. This is random fiber laser. The fiber aspect of the random laser is not important in the map, so I'm using uh, it uh, simply because that's the example I'm going to show you later, the experimental example. And the inverse temperature is related to the pump energy. So if you accept this, and nonlinearity is introduced in the system, in the, in the photonic system, by, by this increasing the pump energy. So you have nonlinearity, and you have disorder as well, okay? because this is, this is a characteristic uh, feature of a uh, random laser. Okay, so what we did there, this is the experimental group. I'm a theoretical physicist, so I, I didn't do the experiment, okay? Uh, what the uh, uh, experimental group uh, back in our uh, institution, uh, in the uh, Department of Physics of FBA did was a, a set of works in which we have both characterized the spin glass phase back in 2016 and found a lot of uh, interesting features associated with this phase. For instance, a Levy-like uh, distribution for the intensity, for the emitted intensity that, that was in 2070, found uh, close, very close to the transition. You, you get this Levy-like. It's Gaussian well below the transition. It's also Gaussian above the transition, but close to the transition is Levy-like. We found this in 2017, this turbulence-like uh, feature that I'm going to describe here in the moment. And also other aspects like uh, extreme value statistics, also following the, the basic theorems of uh, extreme value statistics, which is related to the Levy-like uh, behavior and Gaussian behavior in, in both uh, phases that I described it before. And uh, more uh, uh, recently found uh, evidence for the coexistence of the spin glass phase and the turbulence-like phase, and, and also a Floquet phase. So this is a sec. A, set, a, a long set of works. I'm not going to talk about all of them, of course, but some of them, uh, at, at least the, the turbulence-like uh, effect I'm going to describe now. Okay, the first, let's start with the evidence, experimental demonstration for replica symmetry breaking. Uh, the people who did it first was, uh, this was first observed in a 2D random laser. Here I'm talking about photonic replica symmetry breaks, no longer magnetic, okay? Forget the magnetic, I'm not going to make any connection uh, anymore. So it's the, 
if you now look at a 2D random laser, you get the experimental evidence for replica symmetry breaking by defining a novel parameter. I'm going to give you the equation uh, in a moment. Uh, what is the photonic equivalent of the Parisi uh, overlap parameter. And the evidence is simply to uh, take the experimental data, the experimental series, and look at the distribution. So, as I said before, if it is unimodal, you know you are in the paramagnetic photonic phase. If it is bimodal, you know you are in the spin glass phase. This is how it has been characterized. And what is interesting is that if you look at the point where the distribution has a maximum, so here it would be key equals zero, and here it would be the, av the, the modulus would be one, so it could be either minus one or one, uh, so the modulus is one. Uh, it coincides, so the spin glass transition coincides precisely with the threshold for lasing. So you could use this other parameter as a way of characterizing or finding the precise position where, where the uh, lasing occurs, which is, from an experimental point of view, is a, is a, is a good thing. It's, it, it's not so easy in, in random uh, lasers to find a good criteria to, to, to localize the, the transition point. In the UF, UFPE group, uh, several kinds of characterization of this replica symmetry breaking has, has been found and published in different uh, kinds of lasers. Uh, here's a 3D sample with neodymium, uh, another 3D sample with titanium oxide, titanium and, uh, plus a dye, and this is the one uh, which we are, I'm going to talk about uh, in a moment, which is the erbium doped uh, fiber, uh, with br uh, random fiber laser with bra gratings. Okay, o all of them should have this feature that that's, uh, the Q coincides the, the change in the value of Q, that is, the change in the form of the distribution uh, happens precisely at the threshold for the lasing transition. Okay, but how does it look? Uh, ex the experiment was done as follows. Uh, you took the sample and you excite it with a continuous wave pumping uh, laser, and by uh, using a spectrometer, you, you got the full spectrum as a function of time. And, and in this early experiment in 2016, they took 2,000 spectra, full spectra, okay, as a function of time. And since the system was prepared in the same way, we are in the condition that Parisi uh, prescribed for, for, for getting the replicas, is that you prepare the system the same way, and it goes to a, a different macroscopic uh, state, and that difference is seen in the different spectra. So the spectra looks more, like, more or less like the same, but it's not. There are small uh, detailed differences. If, if I enlarge this, I cannot do it out now, but if you enlarge this, if you see small fluctuations here, okay? The maximum in here as well. So the details are different. So we interpret all these spectra as being replicas of the same scene. They, they have been prepared in the same way, but they are different, okay? The spectra is slightly different in one detail and the other. And here is below three shots, 0 0.5 below three shots. He is around the three shot, and he is above the three shot. And if you look at the Parisi uh, overlap parameter, you see a clear change in its in its form, from this uh, single mode uh, distribution to a bimodal distribution. Ah, Q, what is QMAX? Uh, QMAX. Here. What is Q? Okay. You, you want to see the formula? I promised to show you, but okay, since you are asking now, let's do it now. Yes, I'm going to show you later. <laughs> so Q is the analog, the photonic analog of the uh, overlap parameter, which is essentially a Pearson coefficient. Okay, so it's uh, here the delta is uh, uh, the intensity at uh, a certain mode. So wavelengths, uh, minus its average. Uh, this average is taken over the whole sequence, 2,000 in, this, in, in the case I showed you before, and then divided by its uh, square root of variance. The oh, alpha, okay. In the experiment, is the different uh, spectra, because the system has been prepared in the same way. It's a continuous pumping. So the system is prepared in the same way, but the spectra is slightly different. We need to 2,000 of them. We repeat the experiment, essentially. Yes. No, no, no. The dot is the same. It's fixed. The dot is fixed. 
what is changing is uh, okay if you if you accept the, the the yeah small details in the initial condition maybe or or the system went into because it had this complex landscape and it, it got trapped into a minimum local minimum which is not global minimum so it's ah, okay that's a good point and that's that's the reason why we decided to work with the random fiber laser. So I'm going back and forth with the presentation, but I'm going to answer that. There is a way, a very precise way of building changes, control changes in the index of refraction. It's called black grating, so that you, the disorder is fixed in the fiberglass. So you, 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 you know there is no change in the disorder as you increase, for instance, the pumping energy. You, you, you could think of this. So it's, it's, it's a problem. The 3D samples already have powder, but not here. Okay, this is fixed back construction. Okay, well, let's go back. Now here is a, a, a way. So you you can't see the the transition by using by looking at the width of the spectrum of the of the emitted light, and uh, of course if, when you go to the transition it it narrows immensely. That's that, that's uh, what you associated with the lasing transition. And this is what we are showing here, this uh, changes in the width of the distribution of the intensity, emitted intensity, the lasing intensity, and the Q parameter. Then you see that it changes uh, as, as you, uh, Q is the, is the, is the uh, blue, blue, blue dots. So if, when, when the pumping energy approaches one, the threshold, then the distribution goes by model, and at the same time, the width of the distribution uh, narrows down enormously, okay? showing that it's lazy. So the lazing coincides more or less in the same region, so it's, uh, which is around this. This is m more or less large, but this is the region also where we see Levy statistics. Okay? So it's Gaussian here, Gaussian here, and Levy in this region. The difference is the, is the pumping. Yes, the pumping is changing. As we increase the pumping, it goes from unimodal to bimodal. Okay? Right. So, now turbulence. How do you see turbulence? So, spin glass has been established by several groups, not just us, not just our group. Several groups have established. So, people are already accepting that this, this, uh, this is there, but turbulence, right? especially turbulence like cascade phenomena, like, like Giovanni uh, described. Evidence of turbulent behavior in random fiber laser and in random laser has also been published in the literature. And people have found in several, uh, here are three, it goes back, uh, maybe you cannot see, 2012, 2013, and 2016, people have argued that there are turbulent transitions uh, in optical wave propagation, and here's a one-dimensional system where we have wave turbulence, there's a specific kind of uh, turbulence, wave turbulence, and the laminar turbulent transition in fiber laser, which is specifically the system I'm going to talk about now. So, how do we describe it? Let's look at the turbulence in fluids. In turbulence in fluids, we have velocity. The velocity distribution is Gaussian, below the transition and above the turbulent transition. But the increments in velocity distribution, they show these heavy tails you have showed you in, in the graph. So, the trick appears to be look at the increment. If they, mind you, if the increments are statistically independent, that you are bound to find a Gaussian distribution. Okay, that's the theorem, central limit. But if they are correlated in some way, and you expect them to be correlated because of the spin glass phase, then maybe in the increment of distributions of the several replicas of the system, then maybe we could find the heavy tails we would associate with turbulence or at least associated with intermittence, which is just one feature of turbulence. But in order to get the full Komagorov construction, we need, of course, to have these scales, these different scales. We don't know many we are going to find, so you have to be extracted from the data. This is completely experimental work, so we just uh, have to uh, uh, find a, a good statistical uh, construction or, or technique in order to, uh, to, to get these numbers, and also have the cascade, okay? So the flux of energy from one scale to the other, uh, and intermittency. We need these three, three features. 
Okay, so this is the, the paper where this, the, the results were published. The system, uh, the, a cartoon of the system. Of course, it's an optical fiber. So it has this feature that uh, Ara uh, asked about. So we have this, the, the disorder is fixed, completely controlled. We know how many and where it's positioned. So it's, it, it, it's done by a uh, this Raman, uh, this, this collaborator, Raman Kashyap in Canada. He's done this very careful uh, construction. So it's, it's man-made, or very controlled. Uh, so we use as a, as a gain medium uh, a, a ra rare earth. Uh, in, in, in the case, this is abium uh, top. The, the core is top. This is, of course, essential for the lasing. And we found uh, these this three behaviors that I'm going to show you uh, now. Okay. The, in summary, what you find that is that below the threshold, we get the Gaussian distribution. I'm going to show the pictures in, in a moment. So it's a Gaussian distribution below, below the threshold. In the vicinity of the threshold, we have a combination of K distributions. What is K distributions? It's precisely this universality class, S equals half, if you take N equals one. Okay? So S equals half, N equals one. This is the K distribution. You can write in terms of Maya, G functions, if you like. But in the literature, it's, called, it's, it's known as the K distribution. So you find a mixture of K distribution. The reason why it's a mixture, we also understand. We attribute it because we have a combination of two processes, spontaneous and stimulated emission, and they, they have different contributions to the, uh, to the distribution. This is, this is why we get a mixture. And also, there is a mixture above the transition, but now it's different. It's no longer K distribution. It's now a mild G distribution with N equals 6. Okay? So we expect N to scale in, the, in, the, in, in fluid turbulence. N is scale with the Reynolds numbers. The larger the Reynolds number, the more turbulent the physics uh, of the system, the, the regime of the physics, the higher this N. That is the number of levels that's needed in this, in this uh, cascade effect. So this, in this case, we found N equals 6. In here, the data. So the model Giovanni uh, presented give, gives us the, the red lines. So the, the numerical procedure is essentially the same that he described. We, 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 we find the, so you assume that this is locally Gaussian. We know that it's Gaussian because the intensity distribution, uh, the intensity distribution is Gaussian below threshold, and it's also Gaussian in the large scale. We check that with the, in, with the data. So, this is Gaussian we, uh, with average zero, and the variance fluctuates with these functions f, and f is taken from this hierarchical model, and we found that. So below threshold, there is nothing interesting, n equals zero, it's Gaussian, but above threshold, we get this extraction exponential, which is the s equals half, universality class, and n equals six. So you have this heavy tail, and the fitting is exceptionally good. Okay. But this system has also shown some spin glass behavior. We are inside the spin glass phase if you are above the transition. So how does the spin glass phase talk to the turbulent phase? How do they have to coexist? Otherwise, one of them is wrong. And we found this uh, citation by the uh, son of Agebor, who is son of Niels Bohr. Uh, he's called Thomas Bohr, and in this, uh, he we, in, and collaborators have written a, a very provocative statement in this book, Dynamical System Approach to Turbulence, and I'm going to read it to you. So the existence of a connection between fluid dynamic turbulence and the spin glasses is fascinating, although it is too early to decide whether it can pave the way to a deep understanding of intermittency in fully developed turbulence. So he's already speculating on the possibility that the physics of spin glass and the physics of turbulence could be connected in some way. It's still hard to know, to work out the details, because the equations are completely different. Apparently, no relation between the equations. Of course, navier stokes equations, you cannot use them for describing lasing. So it has to, it has to have some, some kind of uh, general uh, statistical argument that could relate the two. And I, that's, I believe, is going to be the CLT argument that I'm going to give you in a moment. So, 20 years later, we found evidence, experimental evidence, at least in this photonic system. It's not the original spin glass that uh, Thomas Bohr was talking about, 
but is this uh, analog, photonic analog, and there we define, we have this Paris overlap parameter that gives you the spin glass, and you have this, which is the same, equation last, so the increment distribution have this Maya G functions. Okay, how can we make these two compatible? How can I make one talk to the other? What we discovered is that we need to change the Paris overlap parameter in a way that it allows us to see intermittency. And that's the way that's done. So, since we have now several replicas, in Parisi original formulations, you should take the overlap between two replicas irrespective of, the, of their time uh, difference. Okay? So, we just make a complete uh, in, uh, constructions in which it's, uh, the, the overlap is uh, irrestrictive of the time difference. But if you make this restriction, so you only include in the overlap parameters replicas with a certain fixed time separation, and that's the tau parameter is for that, then you get a generalization of Parisi parameter. Of course, tau equals zero is the, the usual Parisi parameter, but now you have this tau parameter uh, that we can more or less control and find distributions that are going to be very different from the Parisi distribution. In particular, uh, for tau equals 1, we expect to see intermittencies. Okay, I'm not going to show this, this, this uh, now, but I want you to try and guess. What do you expect? It's much more uh, dramatic if you try and to make a guess. Because we did that, we guessed before. Okay, it's that's that's. Uh. Okay, so the Paris for tau equals zero, you get bimodal. What do you expect if you have intermittency and you get this selection? Anyone? The zero. Yes. Why? So it's picked at zero. But why it's picked at zero? The reason is that intermittency. What does it mean? It means that the rare events, they get enhanced. That's what heavy tails means. Huh? Very large fluctuations in Gaussian are enhanced. This is why you, you get this power law, Streck's exponential, that's what it means. And here, the rarest event is k equals zero, so expect an enhancement. But how big is this enhancement going to be? That's we cannot guess, of course, we have to look at the data, and that's precisely what we found. And this is, this is the this distribution. And, and incidentally, the red lines are the the theoretical predictions from age theory. Okay? All red lines in all, in all uh, pictures are theoretical predictions. So the fit, this is the fit of the background. So it's still this formula. You can fit the background even for Parisi parameter. Okay? And here's the, the, the sp uh, spacing uh, intensity distribution. Okay, now for the argument. How can we then see in the physics, oh, okay, five minutes, oh my god. <laughs> How can you see in the physics of uh, laser physics, maybe I will, I will leave the quantum uh, crossover transition for, for uh, later on. I, I don't know, Let, let's see if I can uh, make the argument in five minutes. So the idea comes from Lepri and co-workers, and he is essentially a semi-classical model in which you have diffusion in the presence of a, a medium that can provide you with a gain. So it's gain and loss. Okay? So if it's lazy, gain is over, overwhelming loss. And the basic idea is, to, is you, if you get this particular pass, so you decompose the intensity that you measure in terms of a sum of paths. And for, a, for each pass, you get a trajectory of certain lengths L, and on a scale that's the gain lens, that's the lens you have to uh, diffuse in the, in the active medium in order to get a first amplification of the photon. Start with a single photon. This is a single uh, spontaneous emitted photon. And it gets amplified, of course. And uh, after uh, a certain lens, then this, this amplification is exponential. In the end, the bottom line of the argument is that you get a, s a random sum of variables with a random number. You don't know how many paths you need in order to get this intensity that is measured. So 
a sum of random variables, of random number of random variables. This is our new CLT. So let's try to make the argument in terms of CLT. So if you start defining a variable like x, and z is just the deviation from average of x, and you get this, this variable y, and you take the, the, the Fourier transform of y, that's the characteristic function, and then m is fixed, it's large, but fixed. If you take m to infinity, then you, you get the Gaussian distribution. This is the CLT, normal CLT in the single page. But that's not what we need. We need a random number of random variables. And the way to do this technically is called a subordinative process, a process that is subordinated to something else, and that something else is the distribution of the variable n. Maybe this n follows a Poisson process. We, we don't know precisely what it follows, but let's try the simplest one. So it follows the Poisson. Now the characteristic function is the weighted average of this distribution, the Poisson is given here, and the characteristic function of the uh, uh, sum of variables with m fixed. Well, if you do this, CLT, again, Gaussian, nothing happens. I need something else. I need to introduce correlation. I need to go beyond the statements of the usual CLT. And Poisson has no correlation. Let's introduce correlation. One possibility uh, is to use the Pauli process. The Pauli process now is a particular case of the negative binomial uh, process, uh, but that's sufficient to find the distribution that's precisely what you get from age theory. Okay? If you carry on the calculations, you get the characteristic function, you take the Fourier transform, this is precisely the G. This is the, the G2, mind you, is the K distribution. This is the K distribution, the 10. And you carry this on, and now take the full binomial process. So uh, Nicole's one was the Pauli case. Then, then you get the full K distribution. This is precisely the same quantity that you get from uh, age theory, and why not make the general case? So the general case would be the arbitrary n. Now the process has no name in the literature. Right? We are still uh, trying to find a way to characterize it in more details, but has not been before in the literature. That's the distribution, and you, you get exactly the solution of age theory. So age theory can be derived from central limit theory and by this additional assumption that you, you have this subordination process. How many? How many minutes? Two? One? Three minutes. I try just to flash some pictures so that you can see uh, what you can do for a, a quantum chaotic. Uh, so in a quantum chaotic what we what we have, the, n the novelty here, is that we, we now have logarithmic proportion. So I think this audience is more or less know that uh, random matrix has this logarithmic proportion in if you uh, look at it as a Dyson uh, gas. So how do you now include in the signal? So you would more or less put here a, a random matrix distribution and use the same background, the same distribution background. That's, that would be a theory. So can we describe the two most important characteristics of the, of, the, of the integrable chaotic transition? The first one is that the power spec, if you look at the energy eigenvalues of a Laplace operator of a ballistic cavity, as a time series and analyze it as we did for uh, the random laser, then the first thing you can calculate is this power spectrum defined as this equation. And the power spectrum in the large K limit has a power law. And the, the, the exponent uh, is one if you are in the chaotic regime and it's two if you are in the integral, integral regime. But in the transition, it goes from one to the other. And here's a particular kind of billiard called Limasson, uh, uh, described by this equation, when lambda is a parameter that you vary, you change from integrable to, to uh, chaotic by changing lambda, and alpha then follows, goes from one limit to the other, from one to two. Okay, this, the other parameters are not important here, for the argument, and we can also look for the spacing distribution, the distribution of the difference of energy models, the difference of energy, and we, we all know that it goes from Poisson to Wigner Dyson. Okay? Here are more details in the you, you see more details on distribution if you look at the semi-log plots. What are the lines? The lines are the prediction of H theory with n equals one. Okay? So if you put here, if you say that in the phase space you have regions where you get this Wigner uh, Dyson distribution and use the background with n equals one, just one scale, 
then it's sufficient to get this very nice uh, plot uh, fits for, for the spacing distribution. But we did more. We looked at increments of spacing distribution. There is, that not, has not been studied in the literature. And we found a perfect diffusion. So this, this, quantity, this, this is, uh, I, I don't have uh, time here to go into the details how this diffusion is, but it's a perfect diffusion in this uh, parameter space and it also fits well with the data. And we, we did the same for the mushroom <laughs> in order to check that the results are universal. We found the exponents and also the spacing and the increments of spacing. Okay, I don't have time to go into the details here. I just want to flash uh, one equation to show you how the, the fits the, the curves, the theoretical curves are calculated. So this quantity is the focal Planck equation associated with this equation. And here's the dyson brown motion. We simply use dyson brown motion, which describes well the chaotic regime, and we incorporated only two assumptions. The first one is that the, the relaxation parameter, because we have several time scales now, we expect to have several time scales, uh, has this fluctuating property, and also the variance, both the variance and the relaxation parameter. With this, we call it the H theory, so you get all this nice fit for the uh, integral uh, chaotic transition. Yes, yes. No, no, this, this equation gives you, f is fixed by H theory. You don't change. What, what, what this gives is just random matter theory. Okay? But combine, you have to combine, make the integral. Yes, you have to perform this integral. Okay? Once you perform the integral, then you get these G functions and, and you get these nice fits. Okay, thank you very much. <laughs> What's his name? Igor? Igor. Igor. <laughs>